In the wake of the Queen's Gambit's release, the Queen's Gambit's Gambit, if you will, the director of marketing at toy company Goliath Games reported that sales of their chess sets were up by a thousand percent. And as I was eyeing up strategy guides through bookshop windows and signing up to chess.com, it became clear that the show has afflicted viewers with some kind of infectious fantasy, leaving us wanting this thrill for ourselves, which is fitting for a coming of age drama being about a period in life defined by wanting. As many teens long for, uh, I don't know, adventure in the great wide somewhere. But not unlike the cold, harsh reality of my chess playing, our wants are often best served hypothetically, played out as daydreams and musical numbers, which is the somewhat counterintuitive nature of satisfaction. Because, as musical numbers tell us, happy is what happens when all your dreams come true. Well, isn't it? The deceptive cadence that ends this line from the musical Wicked suggests otherwise. Yeah, that chord progression doesn't sound very sure of itself to me. Because, often, getting your dreams, it's strange but it seems a little, well, complicated. And that's what the Queen's Gambit is all about. Getting what you want. In this case, winning the International Chess Championship. It's just not the problem of what happens when you lose, but what happens when you don't. Of course, saying that there are two great tragedies in life, one is not getting what you want, the other is getting it, is clearly not breaking new ground. It's a sentiment repeated throughout literary history, from Aesop to Spock. You may find that having is not so pleasing a thing after all, as wanting. Boiling down to one of the oldest untraceable adages, be careful what you wish for. But as Catherine O'Regan said of Jenny Halls' famous and pertinent slogan, protect me from what I want, a cliche is only as pathetic and embarrassing as much as it is true. Halls' words seem to suggest, as they often do, that we aren't fully in control, or at least we can't be trusted to be. As if, despite our beliefs or intentions, we're repeatedly driven by instincts that do not lead to good long-term decisions. And there's no shortage of philosophical analysis of desire, but <laughs> we don't need philosophers, we have TikTok now. All I really want is babysitting mama for the Nintendo Wii. <gasps> awesome! Wait, I feel empty inside. But I got what I wanted, so what's the problem? It wasn't what I really wanted. What I really want is to want. Without a want, what are my goals? What's my motivation? What am I? So now I'm lost. Until I figure it out. What do I want? Well, all I really want is babysitting mama for the Nintendo Wii. What this excellent looping nightmare from Drive 45 demonstrates is how we define ourselves by our aspirations. Wants provide the perfect narrative drive, and such narratives tend to end with the character getting what they want. The key word here being end. Before I dreamed of being a chess champion, I had many other dreams fostered by other limited series, like this one partly following auditions for Cirque du Soleil. These acrobats were just so sure of what they wanted, and what they wanted was to join Cirque du Soleil. And for those 13-23 minute episodes, so did I. Because I wanted to have a thing. A thing to get or not get. It's an alluring kind of simplicity, but one much more suited to TV than real life. What happens to the successful applicants when one day, surely not that far off, their time there is over? TV says, Shh, don't worry about it, that's the end! Da, 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 da. But despite its own narrative closure, the Queen's Gambit does worry about it. If you're world champion at 16, what'll you do with the rest of your life? Though the worry here isn't really about having, but fittingly, considering the context of chess, about losing. The first sight of loss, of course, is this loss of purpose, but that's just the beginning. If the problem of wanting things is that sometimes you get them, the problem with having things is that one day you might not have them anymore. Loss, and our defences against it, are felt throughout the entire show. From Beth's loss of her mother at the opening, to her subsequent strategy to keep everyone at a distance. Because you can't lose anyone if you don't let them in to begin with. And in retreating to a space where she knows she can win. I feel safe in it. 
I can control it. I can dominate it. But if your sense of control, your self-worth, your whole identity is tied to winning a chess match, if you lose, you lose much more than the game. Generally, society has an unhealthy relationship with losing. As Judith Butler said of the 2020 US election, we know that Trump will try to do anything to stay in power, to avoid that ultimate catastrophe in life, becoming a loser. It's an emotional response that proves Jenny Holzer right once again. When I accidentally lose a piece in chess, I want to claim an opposing piece. Even if it's a bad move, even if it will do more damage to me in the long run. In the face of loss, I can't always be trusted to act rationally. Sure, my head tells me to resign with dignity, but my heart wants to kick and scream and cry. And that's the problem with being a prodigy. It defines you by something you will inevitably lose. And it has the shelf life of milk. And you're far too old to be called a prodigy anymore. But anyone unfortunate enough to be defined by external achievement or aptitude runs the same risk of spoiling. Harry, for example, doesn't go on to be the chess master he was originally introduced as. And despite his apparent happiness anyway, Beth's gaze can't help but seem condescending, pitying. Or maybe that's just as much my own projection as I myself can't help but internalise at least some of that toxic societal baggage, leading us to evaluate our worth based on quantifiable metrics of achievement like a Forbes article that can't help but let you know that Netflix's stock value is down 8.6%. And just as we can lose sight of ourselves outside of our wants, the same process can repeat with our haves. In the book An Absolutely Remarkable Thing, Hank Green writes about a character April May, glimpsing their most probable future. That one day the most interesting and important thing about me would be a thing I did a long time ago. People would say, oh, you were April May, as if I was once something, but not anymore. And when it comes to exploring this fear of no longer being, there's maybe no context more suitable than chess. So tied as it is to the game of life, as in life and death, not this game of life. Hasbro complicating everything. Which is maybe thanks to Ingmar Bergman's film The Seventh Seal, where chess is used to literally try to cheat death. Where even when there's no winning, as long as you can keep playing, you can hold off the inevitable. That final, ultimate state of no longer being. But the Queen's Gambit does manage to cheat death, in a way evading the ruin it foreshadows in favour of a much more optimistic outlook. And so you could say that the show itself gives us what we want. It's comforting. Or if we were to engage in the kind of cynicism the show resolutely rejects, coddling. Not just in its happy ending, but in allowing us to retreat to this space of possibility. That's the real fantasy. And it's everywhere. In the title, The Queen's Gambit, named after an opening move. The point in the game where every path is still open to us. In the stylish melodrama, bold and bright and perfectly suited to adolescence. In its 60s period setting, so much of our recent history is still to happen. For many of us, our whole lives still to happen. So much that here in this fantasy could still play out differently. But it is just a fantasy. One where sexism is only invoked to sweeten the triumph we know is coming, and racism another mere inconvenience to be overcome in kind. Where your childhood friend will suddenly and inexplicably come to your rescue while telling you that no, she's not your fairy godmother, and no, she's certainly absolutely not the problematic plot device that she actually very much is. Writer Aaron Bardi commented as such. Going on to say that while Beth's friend Jolene claims that Beth would surely come to her rescue should she ever need it, that moment never comes. The show ends before it can be tested, so that Chekhov's empathy can stay on the mantle. This too might be a certain kind of fantasy. If no one needs your help or solidarity, you never have to find out if you're actually a good person. If every option is always open, there are never any consequences. And with no consequences comes no personal responsibility. 
This is also partly what's at stake in the fantasy of the genius, which, as The Atlantic observes, aligns with Western individualism. A cultural ideal tracing a person's success to the singular qualities or abilities they possess. This means we can't blame others for our failure, but more crucially, it means others can't blame anything on us, no matter how much we might be at fault. Relying on other people can be scary. Not just because they might let us down, but because we might let them down. And then what kind of person would we be? But even if Schrodinger's Beth is never tested on her commitment to Jolene, in embracing community, both helping and accepting help, the Queen's Gambit at least begins to unpack the ideology behind her self-imposed isolation, encouraging us to stop worrying about individual status and to act simply as the underrated semi-sonic song appearing on the soundtrack album for the film with the same name would tell us. It is for the, for the love of the game. Loss has no shortage of outlets for its sadness. From the misplaced empathy I feel for broken appliances or worn out shoes that could not withstand my love, to the fantasy of being really good at something that could not withstand my lack of ability or resistance to having to try at all. But that was never about actually being really good at something. It only ever works as a fantasy, where you can live in a single moment forever everything won and still everything to play for. Where you can have your queen and sacrifice it too. A move the queen's gambit is a master of. Forever wanting to stay in this space where there's always still everything to play for. But maybe there always is. Because real possibility isn't about getting what you want, but not even knowing what that is. If we stop trying to become something, our reward, as Oscar Wilde put it, will be to never become anything. To see how many options are available. What do we do when we finish the game? We play again.